Chapter Nine, Part Two of A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Bradshaw. A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Chapter Nine some reflections upon the life of miranda and showing how it may and ought to be imitated by all her sex let every one but guard against the vanity of dress let them but make their use of clothes a matter of conscience let them but desire to make the best use of their money and then every one has a rule that is sufficient to direct them in every state of life this rule will no more let the great be vain in their dress than intemperate in their liquors, and yet will leave it as lawful to have some difference in their apparel as to have some difference in their drink. But now will you say that you may use the finest, richest wines when and as you please, that you may be as expensive in them as you have a mind, because different liquors are allowed? If not, how can it be said that you may use clothes as you please, and wear the richest things you can get, because the bare difference of clothes is lawful? for as the lawfulness of different liquors leaves no room nor any excuse for the smallest degree of intemperance in drinking so the lawfulness of different apparel leaves no room nor any excuse for the smallest degrees of vanity in dress to ask what is vanity in dress is no more a puzzling question than to ask what is intemperance in drinking and though religion does not here state the particular measure for all individuals yet it gives such general rules as are a sufficient direction in every state of life. He that lets religion teach him that the end of drinking is only so far to refresh our spirits as to keep us in good health and make soul and body fitter for all the offices of a holy and pious life, and that he is to desire to glorify God by a right use of this liberty, will always know what intemperance is in his particular state. So he that lets religion teach him that the end of clothing is only to hide our shame and nakedness, and to secure our bodies from the injuries of weather, and that he is to desire to glorify God by a sober and wise use of this necessity, will always know what vanity of dress is in his particular state. And he that thinks it a needless nicety to talk of the religious use of apparel, has as much reason to think it a needless nicety to talk of the religious use of liquors. For luxury and indulgence in dress is as great an abuse as luxury and indulgence in eating and drinking, and there is no avoiding either of them, but by making religion the strict measure of our allowance in both cases. And there is nothing in religion to excite a man to this pious exactness in one case, but what is as good a motive to the same exactness in the other. Father, as all things that are lawful are not therefore expedient, so there are some things lawful in the use of liquors and apparel, which, by abstaining from them for pious ends, may be made means of great perfection. Thus, for instance, if a man should deny himself such use of liquors as is lawful, if he should refrain from such expense in his drink as might be allowed without sin, if he should do this not only for the sake of a more pious self-denial, but that he might be able to relieve and refresh the helpless, poor, and sick, if another should abstain from the use of that which is lawful in dress, if he should be more frugal and mean in his habit than the necessities of religion absolutely require, if he should do this not only as a means of a better humility, but that he may be more able to clothe other people, these persons might be said to do that which was highly suitable to the true spirit, though not absolutely required by the letter of the law of Christ. For if those who give a cup of cold water to a disciple of Christ shall not lose their reward, Matthew chapter 10 verse 42, how dear must they be to Christ, who often give themselves water, that they may be able to give wine to the sick and languishing members of Christ's body. But to return, all that has been here said to married women may serve for the same instruction to such as are still under the direction of their parents. Now, though the obedience which is due to parents does not oblige them to carry their virtues no higher than their parents require them, yet their obedience requires them to submit to their direction in all things not contrary to the laws of God. If, therefore, your parents require you to live more in the fashion and conversation of the world, or to be more expensive in your dress and person, or to dispose of your time otherwise than suits with your desires after greater perfection, you must submit and bear it as your cross, 
till you are at liberty to follow the higher counsels of Christ, and have it in your power to choose the best ways of raising your virtue to its greatest height. Now, although, whilst you are in this state, you may be obliged to forego some means of improving your virtue, yet there are some others to be found in it that are not to be had in a life of more liberty. For if in this state, where obedience is so great a virtue, you comply in all things lawful out of a pious, tender sense of duty, then those things which you thus perform are, instead of being hindrances of your virtue, turned into means of improving it. What you lose by being restrained from such things as you would choose to observe, you gain by that excellent virtue of obedience in humbly complying against your temper. Now, what is here granted is only in things lawful, and therefore the diversion of our English stage is here accepted, being elsewhere proved, as I think, to be absolutely unlawful. Thus much to show how persons under the direction of others may imitate the wise and pious life of Miranda. But as for those who are altogether in their own hands, if the liberty of their state makes them covet the best gifts, if it carries them to choose the most excellent ways, if they, having all in their own power, should turn the whole form of their life into a regular exercise of the highest virtues, happy are they who have so learned Christ. All persons cannot receive this saying. They that are able to receive it, let them receive it and bless that Spirit of God which has put such good motions into their hearts. God may be served and glorified in every state of life. But as there are some states of life more desirable than others, that more purify our natures, that more improve our virtues, and dedicate us unto God in a higher manner, so those who are at liberty to choose for themselves seem to be called by God to be more eminently devoted to his service. Ever since the beginning of Christianity there have been two orders or ranks of people amongst good Christians. The one that feared and served God in the common offices and business of a secular worldly life, the other, renouncing the common business and common enjoyments of life as riches, marriage, honours and pleasures, devoted themselves to voluntary poverty, virginity, devotion and retirement, that by this means they might live wholly unto God in the daily exercise of a divine and heavenly life. This testimony I have from the famous ecclesiastical historian Eusebius, who lived at the time of the first general council, when the faith of our Nicene Creed was established, when the church was in its greatest glory and purity, when its bishops were so many holy fathers and eminent saints. Therefore, said he, there have been instituted in the church of Christ two ways or manners of living. The one, raised above the ordinary state of nature and common ways of living, rejects wedlock, possessions and worldly goods and being wholly separate and removed from the ordinary conversation of common life is appropriated and devoted solely to the worship and service of god through an exceeding degree of heavenly love they who are of this order of people seem dead to the life of this world and having their bodies only upon earth are in their minds and contemplations dwelling in heaven from whence like so many heavenly inhabitants they look down upon human life making intercessions and oblations to Almighty God for the whole race of mankind, and this not with the blood of beasts or the fat or smoke and burning of bodies, but with the highest exercises of true piety, with cleansed and purified hearts, and with a whole form of life strictly devoted to virtue. These are their sacrifices, which they continually offer unto God, imploring His mercy and favour for themselves and their fellow creatures. Christianity receives this as the perfect manner of life. The other is of a lower form, and suiting itself more to the condition of human nature, admits of chaste wedlock, the care of children and family, of trade and business, and goes through all the employments of life under a sense of piety and fear of God. Now they who have chosen this manner of life have their set times for retirement and spiritual exercises, and particular days are set apart for their hearing and learning the word of God. And this order of people is considered as in the second state of piety. Eusebius, Demonstratio Evangelica, Book 1, Chapter 8. Thus this learned historian. If, therefore, persons of either sex, moved with the life of Miranda and desirous of perfection, should unite themselves into little societies, professing voluntary poverty, virginity, retirement and devotion, living upon bare necessities that some might be relieved by their charities, 
and all be blessed with their prayers, and benefited by their example. Or if, for want of this, they should practice the same manner of life, in as high a degree as they could by themselves, such persons would be so far from being chargeable with any superstition or blind devotion, that they might be justly said to restore that piety which was the boast and glory of the church when its greatest saints were alive. Now, as this learned historian observes, that it was an exceeding great degree of heavenly love that carried these persons so much above the common ways of life to such an eminent state of holiness, so it is not to be wondered at that the religion of Jesus Christ should fill the hearts of many Christians with this high degree of love. For a religion that opens such a scene of glory, that discovers things so infinitely above all the world, that so triumphs over death, that assures us of such mansions of bliss where we shall so soon be as the angels of God in heaven, what wonder is it if such a religion, such truths and expectations, should, in some holy souls, destroy all earthly desires, and make the ardent love of heavenly things be the one continual passion of their hearts? If the religion of Christians is founded upon the infinite humiliation, the cruel mockings and scourgings, the prodigious sufferings, the poor persecuted life and painful death of a crucified Son of God, what wonder is it if many humble adorers of this profound mystery, many affectionate lovers of a crucified Lord, should renounce their share of worldly pleasures, and give themselves up to a continual course of mortification and self-denial, that thus suffering with Christ here, they may reign with him hereafter? If truth itself has assured us that there is but one thing needful, what wonder is it that there should be some amongst Christians so full of faith as to believe this in the highest sense of the words, and to desire such a separation from the world, that their care and attention to the one thing needful may not be interrupted? If our blessed Lord hath said, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Matthew chapter 19 verse 21 what wonder is it that there should be amongst Christians some such zealous followers of Christ, so intent upon heavenly treasure, so desirous of perfection, that they should renounce the enjoyment of their estates, choose a voluntary poverty, and relieve all the poor that they are able? If the chosen vessel St. Paul hath said, He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord, and that there is this difference also between a wife and a virgin, the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 32 to 34. What wonder is it if the purity and perfection of the virgin state hath been the praise and glory of the church in its first and purest ages, that there have always been some so desirous of pleasing God, so zealous after every degree of purity and perfection, so glad of every means of improving their virtue, that they have renounced the comforts and enjoyments of wedlock, to trim their lamps, to purify their souls, and wait upon God in a state of perpetual virginity. And if in these our days we want examples of these several degrees of perfection, if neither clergy nor laity are enough of this spirit, if we are so far departed from it, that a man seems like St. Paul at Athens, a set a forth of strange doctrines, Acts chapter 17 verse 18, when he recommends self-denial, renunciation of the world, regular devotion, retirement, virginity and voluntary poverty, it is because we are fallen into an age where the love not only of many but of most is waxed cold. I have made this little appeal to antiquity, and quoted these few passages of scripture to support some uncommon practices in the life of Miranda, and to show that her highest rules of holy living, her devotion, self-denial, renunciation of the world, her charity, virginity, voluntary poverty, are founded in the sublimest counsels of Christ and his apostles, suitable to the high expectations of another life, proper instances of a heavenly love, and all followed by the greatest saints of the best and purest ages of the church. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew chapter 11 verse 15 End of chapter 9 part 2 Recording by Jenny Bradshaw